those that have um, joined us live. Um, this session will be recorded and that's so that we can, um, it, the recording can be available afterwards. I'm Helen and I'm um, Deputy Chair of the Parkrun Research Board. If you're with us live uh, this afternoon, just to let you know that it's being recorded, um, please do keep your microphones on, on mute whilst the speakers are talking, um, but feel free to use the chat function for any questions, any reflections or comments that you have as our speakers are talking. Um, there will be a Q&A after all of our speakers have spoken which you can use the chat for or to, um, unmute yourself um, to ask that question if you want. So we're really pleased to welcome you to the third seminar in our series brought to you by the Parkrun Research Board. Um, the recording of this um, seminar will be available via our Parkrun Research Board website and it will also be put on the Parkrun YouTube channel afterwards if you're wanting a copy of it. So in this seminar, we're going to discuss a really common condition, arthritis. Um, our Parkrun um, survey, um, health and wellbeing survey, told us that many people are running, walking and volunteering in Parkrun while living with arthritis. And today we're going to explain what arthritis is, what creates the symptoms and how exercise can really help manage it. And we'll bust some of the myths around running and walking with arthritis and give some tips on how we can get the best out of participating in something like Parkrun to help this condition. So to kick things off today, we've got Dr. Laura Durkin. Laura is a consultant rheumatologist, physician and associate clinical professor in the Royal College of Surgeons Ireland. Her subspeciality interests are in systematic, systemic lupus, I'm going to really demonstrate my uh, lack of lack of knowledge here. Um, Laura, please help me. Uh, Erthematosis, women's health and in exercise and inflammatory disease. So I'm going to pass you over to the clearly the expert in this. Um, Laura, please take it away. Uh, yeah, we never give anything an easy name in rheumatology. <laughs> it's, part of, it's, it's part of our mystery and uh, uh, mystique. We make it sound very complicated. Uh, lupus would have been totally fine. Sorry. Um, so hello, everybody. Um, I am going to uh, speak a little bit. Can you see my slides? Um, about, um, I suppose, arthritis, exercising with arthritis. And I'm going to give you a whistle stop tour of the most common types of arthritis and some of the questions that patients ask me. Um, Look, Laura, we just can't see your slides just yet. Oh, sorry. Here we go. Perfect, thank you. Okay, so the different types of arthritis, what treatments we consider when somebody is diagnosed with arthritis, and I suppose what patients ask me when I when I tell them that they have arthritis and the coping strategies that they might look for, and I and I think further our, our further speakers will talk a little bit more specifically about the exercise prescriptions in patients with arthritis. Um, so broadly categorizing different types of arthritis, so osteoarthritis is by far the most common type of arthritis, and we would. Um, about you know 20% of adults have some form of OA. So the vast majority of us, it's it, it's probably going to hit. We're going to have some of it. Um, it's classically described as a wear and tear process, but that's not really being true to to OA because osteoarthritis is it is it can be any small insult that starts a process where the cartilage de degrades within the joints and you develop a, the syndrome of bone on bone. So you ruin your hinges. Um, that can happen in the hands, in the knees, in the hips, in the neck. Um, and um, it is really common. And it's probably the biggest barrier that certainly as we get older, people tend to have to, to exercise. Um, rheumatoid arthritis, on the other hand, is an inflammatory autoimmune arthritis, different to osteoarthritis, um, which we treat in different ways. Um, I've highlighted here osteoarthritis and rheumatoid because they're the two I'm going to talk about most because they're actually common arthritis, whereas the other ones, psoriatic, axial spondylo arthropathy and lupus are less common. Um, and then we talk about gouty arthritis or gout and pseudo gout, which are both acute um, painful red syndromes that happen when you have crystals within your joints and they cause inflammation. So these are more like flare type scenarios. Um, so OA and RA, I'll refer to them as in my talk. So that's osteoarthritis and rheumatoid arthritis. 
Um, so to start with osteoarthritis, I'm gonna, I think a picture paints a thousand words. So if you look at the top picture here, so we have, this is your a thigh bone, um, and these are the two bones that are in your calf. And for you to have a good hinge between your, um, your knee, you need a space similar to a hinge on a door. So for something to bend, it needs the space to be able to do so. And you can clearly see on the top x-ray that there's no space between the bone in the thigh and the bones that are in the calf. And so for that person to move, you can imagine a crunching bone on bone phenomenon. You can't even see the kneecap, but the kneecap kind of floats like an island on top of these two. If you look at the lower picture, that's a normal knee. So that's what you should have. So you should have ample room to imagine that you can have a hinge joint there. And so over time, what happens is the normal knee, the cartilage becomes thinner for whatever reason um, and wears away, you lose the space. And then over time, the bone, because of the pressure on the bone starts to proliferate and you get lots of this cloudy new bone formation, which makes matters worse. Um, these are the joints that are most commonly affected by osteoarthritis. So people get OA in their neck. That, that will be commonly kind of disc disease and it can be failure to move it in, in, the, in lateral directions. Um, lower back pain commonly caused by osteoarthritis. Base of thumb is a really interesting one because our thumbs and the ability to oppose our thumbs are what um, separates us from other primates or monkeys. And so we really value the base of our thumbs. It's quite a defining feature in humans and it does wear out, unfortunately, and it is a real spot where we get osteoarthritis. Um, hips, uh, similarly, were not necessarily designed to be upright. So we get hip osteoarthritis, knee osteoarthritis. And then because it takes the entire uh, burden of um, both gravity and the weight of our bodies, the base of the toe does tend to be a, a key spot for osteoarthritis. Um, if you look at the hands of somebody with osteoarthritis, um, and I always spot this in, in kind of old or women in particular, it tends to be the distal knuckles that you see um, big lumpy osteoarthritis in. I remember my own grandmother having them and those are called Heberden's and Bouchard nodes. That's nodal osteoarthritis and it happens in the hands. And it's interesting because obviously your finger joints aren't weight bearing, but we do use them a lot over the course of our lives and they do get quite bad. They can get quite bad osteoarthritis. So I suppose the question is once you've diagnosed it, you see those x-rays with the horrible bony overgrowth and the lack of joint space. What, what, what do we do about osteoarthritis? Um, and often I feel that patients, um, you know, they're stiff and sore. Um, off, osteoarthritis often will be that, that you're kind of stiff and sore after activity. Um, and it can get to a point where you're kind of stiff and sore all the time. And people make this jump and they say, oh gosh, well, this is it. This joint is gone. I want it cut out. I would like to put this knee, hip, whatever it is in the bin. Um, but we would consider surgery to be kind of our, our quite far down on our on our management tree. Um, and it, it does have wonderful outcomes, knees and hips in particular. Orthopedic intervention can be life changing. But generally speaking, we start with simpler measures that don't have significant involvement of a scalpel. And um, so we want our patients to get active. We'd like them to be strong. So if people who have in particular lower limb osteoarthritis, so osteoarthritis, in their knees and their hips, they tend to lose an extraordinary amount of muscle because by the time they've diagnosed, often they've been limiting their activity for some, some time. So they've loss of muscle in their glutes. So that's their bottom. Um, and they'll have trouble getting out of a chair without using their hands. And they'll also have lost muscle at the front of the thigh, which will in significantly increase the impact that's going through those already damaged knee joints. Um, so we want our patients to get active. We want them to get moving. Um, and we need them to get strong in specific ways that support the specific joints that are involved. So that often involves specific muscle strengthening exercises, be it the front of the thighs. Um, uh, sometimes it can be the, the we're working on the glutes or the bottom muscles. And other times for kind of shoulder involvement, we can be working on range of motion and strengthening of the shoulder and arm girdle. Weight loss is important, um, but it's not the, the, the only thing that, <laughs> that we need to whip people with. If people, I find that if people get active and they get strong, that weight loss is often um, a really happy accompaniment for those uh, processes. But there is data that even 5% of your body mass or even less, if you lose even five pounds, that that has a significant impact on your biomechanics. In particular, if you have lower limb arthritis, even a small bit of weight loss can have a massive impact on your pain, stiffness, and ability to function. So certainly weight loss is a, a big part of our management strategy. 
Um, and although not the only one, but it can even a, even a small amount of weight can make a massive difference to, to people's ability to function. Uh, medication wise, so unlike the inflammatory arthritis, um, osteo or arthritis, we tend to manage conservatively. So for whatever reason, we're yet to be smart enough to come up with some magic drug that nukes OA because that just doesn't exist. Uh, so we're looking at kind of conservative managements and interventions that make people function, lead a normal life. So we're talking about paracetamol, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, so that's ibuprofen and its cousins. Sometimes we need more painkillers than that and we go for heavier analgesia, but that would be rare. And certainly what you don't want to do is give someone medication that is, you know, that the cure be worse than the disease itself. Um, we look at supportive devices. Certainly if people have bad hip OA and they're going to one side, we may look at a cane or a stick to help them. We may look at knee supports. And ultimately, you know, it, in terms of discussion with the patient and looking at their comorbidities and other diseases they suffer from, we may refer them for orthopedic intervention or surgery. Injections into the joints involved are also um, a consideration. So that's corticosteroid injections. Um, they can be helpful in knees um, and hips, although they are by no means a long-term strategy and they have to be done in association with building up the muscle and increasing strength. So this is just to give you an image of how, as a rheumatologist, I look at both what is in front of me and um, the pattern of what's in front of me and also, I suppose, the patient's blood tests. But if you look at patterns, rheumatoid arthritis and osteoarthritis have totally different patterns as to where they hit the patients. Rheumatoid arthritis is described as a symmetrical polyarthropathy. So what that means is it tends to hit both sides of the body in the same places. Doesn't mean that the body has to be complete mirror images of each other, but it does mean that if you have knuckles on one side, they tend to be knuckles on the other side. Um, and equally, unlike osteoarthritis, it hits in other places. So temporomandibular joint can be involved, you know, shoulders, elbows. And if you look here, the knuckles. So rheumatoid arthritis has a real strong um, desire to rest itself down in the knuckles and, and unlike osteoarthritis, which tends to go more distally into the fingers. If you go down the legs also, osteoarthritis goes for that weight bearing first toe, whereas rheumatoid has no preference for the first toe and tends to go across all, all of the digits. Now, these are x-rays of uh, extraordinarily advanced rheumatoid arthritis. So if anybody is listening who has rheumatoid or indeed osteoarthritis, I hope that this is what's ahead of you. Um, modern therapies mean that really we don't, unless, unless someone is very unlucky, we don't see as much of this advanced deformity as we used to. So if you look here, I'm just showing for pattern purposes, rheumatoid arthritis right here across the knuckles, you have horrible destructive arthritis, um, and equally they're going down through the fingers, whereas the osteoarthritis is a much more distal process, and it tends to, to, to go down to much, much closer to the fingertips. And this here, just for contrast, is a nice normal hand. So rheumatoid arthritis, totally different management paradigm, and um, so non-steroidal analgesia, commonly, but again, they can be quite problematic in terms of the side effect profile. We often will use corticosteroids in particular at the beginning of the disease and also if somebody has a disease flare. So that's prednisone. And that again comes at a cost, lots of side effects of prednisone. Um, but sometimes needs must. Um, we look for patients to for exercise and strengthening in these patients because we know that that improves things. And we also know that rheumatoid more than anything else associates with abnormal body composition. So my patients with rheumatoid have less muscle. Even if they're tiny and skinny, they have more fat than everybody else because their muscle mass is so low. And it makes it really important that they're building up their strength and maintaining and increasing their muscle mass with time. For control of the rheumatoid process itself, so the autoimmune process, we look to what are called disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs. So that's the DMARD word there, word there on my slide. And there are what are called conventional DMARDs, which are usually pills, um, and biologic DMARDs, which are commonly injections, although some of the targeted agents are also pills. Um, and often patients over time will graduate from one to the other. And there's kind of, a, I suppose, a management um, staircase in rheumatoid arthritis that changes over time. Although we sometimes we will increase and decrease as needed, it's likely that most patients with rheumatoid arthritis will be on some form of disease modifying therapy for their lives, unless there's some unless there is a reason not to. 
So there's lots of things we need to consider if somebody has a diagnosis of arthritis and they want to exercise. Um, so the first thing to consider is that these patients tend to have pain and we need to have a strategy in place for them to manage their pain so that they can exercise um, within their limits. Um, we also, they're, they're stiff, um, fatigued and deconditioned. Now it's a strange situation where lots of these, so certainly the stiffness, the fatigue and the deconditioning gets extraordinarily better when they are exercising, but it can be difficult to make the step where you start to exercise because those first few times will be very difficult and mentally challenging to kind of push yourself to that. But once people get into a rhythm, it really does, exercise has been shown to improve your fatigue, your stiffness, and over time people will get back their conditioning and their strength and, and their normal life. Um, in rheumatoid arthritis, there are some extra considerations. Um, so it's osteoporosis, so bone loss, really common in rheumatoid arthritis. And again, benefits from exercising, but it is something that we need to keep in our mind, um, in particular in patients who've had lots of prednisone over the years. Um, rheumatoid nodules are big, lumpy, fleshy lumps that people can have on their bodies who have rheumatoid, and sometimes they can get in the way of exercising. Um, they commonly have what's called Sjogren's or dry eyes and dry mouth. And that can mean that it's really difficult for them to get out in the wind because their eyes are streaming. And in that case, they may need to get protective glasses or something that means that they're not going out and being uncomfortable or wet from water coming down their face. Um, they often, as I referred to already, have abnormal body composition. So although they may look either thin or fat, what they will be is lacking in muscle mass and so getting started they'll be weaker it'll be more difficult for them and I suppose it's a bigger challenge than it will be for um, a regular Joe. Um, then we need to think about the cardiovascular disease so rheumatoid arthritis um, associates with accelerated cardiovascular disease heart attacks um, and, and more vascular abnormalities and that again is impacted hugely by exercise so it's another reason why we can say to our patients i really want you to get moving and um, because because of your arthritis you you are at an increased risk of having a heart attack the last thing i suppose to think about in rheumatoid arthritis is that they get what's called interstitial lung disease associated with rheumatoid arthritis and if you have ra and you're short of breath on exertion you're finding that your breathing is a challenge it is worth saying that to somebody because it is worth screening to see if that is a problem that may be limiting your ability to exercise so i'm just going to take you briefly through some of the questions that my patients ask me but it, it's likely that you with your li lived decisions have much more questions and are there much they will be much more pertinent um can I have a normal life commonly in particular in the inflammatory arthritis as i get asked this and the, the answer is yes um, you know, people who have a diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis will need to see a rheumatologist, they will need to be on therapy, but because of modern therapies, they do have a normal life and hopefully forget that they have a diagnosis of arthritis and they move on, they have babies, they have, you know, normal existences and we've moved, we've moved really far past the arthritis patients um, having an inexorable decline. Will I always have to take medication? So osteoarthritis, the, um, once we get on top of things and have a management strategy in place, it's possible that patients don't need to always take medication. For inflammatory arthritis, medication will always be a part of their lives, most likely. Can I work? Yes, and please do. Outcomes are better for arthritis in patients who continue to work, um, but people may need to have a look at their work practices and perhaps their work positions to ensure that they can continue to do so. Can I exercise? Yes. And certainly we would say that exercise is a disease modifier all by itself, and it should be massively encouraged. And in fact, we would say prescribed in patients with arthritis. Will I pass this on to my kids is the last question I commonly get asked. Rheumatoid arthritis does have a genetic component, as does osteoarthritis, but lots of it, the development of arthritis is just a combination of your environmental stressors. So the world that you live in and a little bit of bad luck. And um, so it's, it, they're not, um, inherited in a linear fashion so no you won't pass this on to anybody so that is the end of my oh how do i manage my symptoms so as part of your arthritis management strategy it's always worth looking at your plan for exercise so taking your medication before you exercise if you identify that stiffness and stiffness at the beginning or at the end of your exercise is a problem the getting on top of things with the physiotherapist so that you're targeting specific muscles that are going to help you and make you feel better is really important. And certainly as part of osteo and rheumatoid arthritis, doing exercises that are strengthening the muscles around your, your involved joints is really important. 
Um, and over time, once you build those muscles, those joints become more stable and in fact will improve. Um, and I think Fiona's going to take a little bit more about the management of specific symptoms and I will take some questions at the end. So thank you. Thanks, Laura. That was a really great presentation, a really nice introduction. Um, please do put any um, questions that you've got for Laura um, in the chat and we'll we'll come to those at the end after after we've had the next two talks. So um, next up, we've got a recorded presentation from Professor Ursula Fearon. Ursula is a professor of molecular, molecular rheumatology at the School of Medicine, Trinity College, Dublin. She is an international leader in translational rheumatology with a focus on preclinical development of biotherapeutics for the early treatment of arthritis and systemic rheumatic diseases. So I think we're just going to get her a presentation up. Hi, my name is Professor Ursula Fearon, and I'm delighted to be here today to talk about the science behind inflammation and does physical activity influence it? So the focus of my research is on rheumatoid arthritis and psoriatic arthritis, which are chronic autoimmune diseases. Now, if you were diagnosed with these diseases 20 to 30 years ago, it was a pretty poor prognosis as the medications weren't very good, if any. So within five years of diagnosis, 50% of patients had functional disability. And within 10 years, a lot of patients had to give up work because of that functional disability. And if you were to ask a clinician at the time what their waiting rooms looked like, they would say they saw a lot, a lot of patients in wheelchairs. This was also highlighted in The Lancet, where they stated for ORA, that the concept of remission inducing drugs was fallacious. So we've made dramatic improvements um, to the treatment strategies for patients over the last 20 years. And this is due to the advent of biologic therapies in the early 2000s. This resulted in improved quality of life and for function um, for these patients living with these diseases. So we can now target proteins that drive inflammation, and we can also target cells that are involved in driving the inflammation. But for the purpose of this talk, I've just highlighted these three inflammatory proteins up here because one, they drive inflammation, but two from the literature, these are really the only three um, proteins that I've found that possibly exercise could alter. So what causes inflammatory arthritis? We don't know what the cause is, but we know an individual's risk is a combination of a genetic background and an environmental insult which could be cigarette smoke, a pathogen in our gut, lungs or mouth, and more recently diet has also been implicated. So what happens? So with that genetic background, combined with an environmental insult, a protein is altered on our cells. But our immune system re mistakenly recognizes this protein as a foreign pathogen. So it actually thinks it's a pathogen that has come into our body like a virus or a bacteria. So it launches an immune attack to try and get rid of it. But what it's actually doing is attacking a protein on our own cells and tissue. And this is what we call autoimmunity. So once the immune cells become activated in our blood, they receive a second signal that instructs them to travel to the joints where they set up shop and cause inflammation. So this is our joint. So these are our bones up here. And this in gray here is the cartilage that protects our bones. And in red is the synovial membrane, which nourishes our joint. So if you take a biopsy of the synovial membrane and look at it under the microscope, this is what it looks like. It's pretty acellular. And these purple dots here are good cells. And they're releasing proteins that nourish the joint. Now, you don't have to be a clinician, a scientist or a pathologist to see that when you take a biopsy from a patient with inflammatory arthritis, it's dramatically different. So all these, it's packed full, firstly, of purple cells, which are immune cells. And these are bad immune cells, many which have traveled from the blood into the joint. And they are producing pro-inflammatory proteins 
that will subsequently break down your cartilage and your bone. And if you take a little video camera and look inside the joint, this is what it looks like. So this is the normal joint and the synovium looks a little bit like cling film and it's pretty acellular. And as I said, its function is to nourish the joint. But when you look into the joint of an ORA patient and PSA patient, you see that the synovial membrane is really inflamed. And you can see kind of finger-like projections here of the synovium that's packed full of immune cells and it's growing towards the cartilage and bone and will subsequently break it down and cause functional disability. So over the last year, my group did a national series of workshops that were patient focused. And at the end of these workshops, we kind of asked the patients, what would they like incorporated into research studies? And really the, the answers were um, pretty much consistent across all the workshops. It was exercise, diet, and sleep. And they just didn't want to know whether exercise, diet, and sleep made them feel better. They also wanted to know, was there actual evidence to suggest that these could alter inflammatory pathways? So I was tasked with the um, job today to present some evidence to suggest that exercise can alter inflammatory pathways. Now, it's not my expertise. And when I did a kind of a literature search on it, there actually is very little information to suggest that exercise can alter inflammation. And it's due to the fact that there's few studies and the few studies that are out there have small cohorts of patients. And then there's a few studies on animal models. So we need much larger cohorts and larger studies to really find good evidence. But in the next couple of slides, I'm going to summarize some of the evidence that's out there, but would need to be repeated in larger cohorts. So the first study looked at a combination of aerobic and resistant exercise over a 12 week period. And what they found was there was a decrease after 12 weeks in those three proteins that I pointed out on the third slide, TNF, IL-6 and IL-1. So if you get a decrease in these proteins, you will get a decrease in inflammation in your joint. Another study looked at high intensity interval walking in ORA patients for 10 weeks. And what they found after the 10 weeks, that there was a reduction in the activation of immune cells in the blood. And the second study also found after interval walking, not alone was there a reduction in the activation of immune cells in the blood, there was also a reduction in the ability of these immune cells to travel to our joints. Then moving into animal models, this is where scientists induce inflammatory arthritis in the animal, and then the animals did treadmill training for three months. So after three months, they found again, one of these proteins, inflammatory proteins was down, which would result in a down regulation of inflammation. But they also found that after three months, there was an ink, well, improvement in cardiac muscle function. So this dual effects here, what we're seeing after three months is a decrease in inflammation, but we're also seeing a reduction in cardiovascular risk, which is associated with inflammatory arthritis. Another animal study looked at bone destruction. And what they found again after three months of treadmill running was there was a down regulation in one of these key inflammatory proteins, which reduced um, joint swelling. But they also found down regulation in this protein called cathespin K, which is involved in bone destruction. And when they looked at the bone by imaging, they found that actually that was indeed the case. That actually in red here, it's indication of bone destruction. So you can clearly see on the right here, which were the mice that did treadmill running, there was less red on the image compared to those that were controls. And this would suggest therefore that there's less bone destruction. And they would suggest that this was probably in part due to the reduction in this protein that degrades bone. So now back to the humans, another study looked at six months of combined aerobic resistance and flexibility exercise. And after six months, they found a change in the balance of genes associated with regulating bone. And they found an increase in anti-bone destroying genes and a decrease in pro-destroying genes. Similarly, another study looking at resistant exercise examined proteins involved in cartilage breakdown. 
and they found that a specific protein called COMP, which is associated with cartilage breakdown, was down after six months of resistant exercise. And again, this basically changed the balance where you got an increase in lower inflammation and a healthy cartilage compared to factors that drove high inflammation and drove cartilage breakdown. Finally, um, another study looked at six months tailored aerobic and resistant exercise intervention improves endothelial cell function. Now endothelial cells are very important cells in our blood vessels. They basically make up our blood vessels. They line the blood vessels. So here we have a normal blood vessel and you can clearly see it's streams lined. The, the width of the blood vessels are consistent and they regularly branch. But when our endothelial cells become dysfunctional, our blood vessels become dysfunctional and they can cause inflammation. So this is a healthy blood vessel. This is what we can see in the inflamed joint. So we get these blood vessels that look very dysfunctional. Their width is inconsistent. They have an inability to branch regularly. And really, they're, they curl up on each other as well. And if you look inside the joint, this is exactly what you see. You see these very dysfunctional blood vessels. And these dysfunctional blood vessels contribute to the inflammation in our joint. So what happened after six months aerobic and resistance exercise? What they found was that the blood vessels started to become more like healthy blood vessels. And this was due to the fact that there was an improvement in endothelial cell function. But what was interesting is that one, they found an improvement in endothelial cells that lined microvasculature blood vessels. So these are blood vessels that are associated with the synovium. So if you've got an improvement in these blood vessels, you will get an improvement in your inflammation. But also what they found was that there was improvement in endothelial cells involved in macro vasculature, and these blood vessels are associated with heart health. So again, what we were seeing here was this aerobic and resistant exercise, one, possibly could reduce inflammation in the joint, but two, could reduce cardiovascular risk. So in summary, the studies that are out there really have shown that aerobic exercise and resistance exercise reduces key um, inflammatory proteins, can reduce proteins involved in bone destruction and cartilage degradation, but it could also improve blood vessel function and reduce inflammation and reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease. So in summary, and I kind of have a bit of a caveat with this, as I said, these um, studies were small and done on a small number of patients, and we need larger studies to really show evidence that these are directly related. But to summarize these studies, they suggest that aerobic exercise and resistance training can reduce pro-inflammatory proteins, can reduce activation and migration of immune cells, can reduce cartilage and bone destruction, and they can also improve endothelial cell function, which have an impact for joint inflammation and cardiovascular disease. Finally, I'd like to thank you all um, for coming to the talks today. I'd like to thank the Park Run Research Board. I'd like to thank Helen Quirk and Fiona Wilson, who invited me here to talk today, participants of the Park Run, and last but definitely not least, the patients. Thank you very much. Well, that was great. So it's starting to um, starting to look positive for exercise and park running. So next up, we have Dr. Fiona Wilson, who's going to talk to us today. Um, so Fiona is a chartered physiotherapist and an associate professor in the School of Medicine at Trinity College Dublin, where she is also head of the discipline of physiotherapy. She has over 30 years of experience in clinical physiotherapy, teaching and research. Her research focuses on the role of exercise in pain and injury, with a specific emphasis on back pain. She's published widely on the role of exercise and physical activity in managing pain and improving well-being in inflammatory arthritis. So over to you, Fiona. Thanks, Helen. Um, I'll just share my screen and open up. Um, you can tell me when you can see. Can you see that? Yep, good to go. Okay. Just minimize myself. Oh, 
Okay, so thanks very much. Thanks for those great talks from Laura and um, from um, Ursula. I have great pleasure to um, work and do research with both of them. So I'm going to try and bring this all together a little bit um, and talk about um, how we can actually use all of that information practically. So exercise and physical activity, you will have all heard of that. What is physical activity is any movement that we do during the day, so everyday activities from when you wake up, open your eyes, roll over in bed, then you, you become physically active. And, and we know there's some really great research that's gone on, particularly over the past 20 to 30 years, that shows that being physically active helps present, prevent a huge range of um, chronic diseases and also helps manage those diseases, it gives you a better life when you have them. And it's a really important part of managing arthritis. I think that, that came through from those previous two talks. And just to put the role of physical activity into context, this, this recent paper came out that showed if you're physically active, your chance of having a better outcome with a COVID infection was um, hugely improved. So less chance of ending up in intensive care, less chance of, of, of dying. So it's across all, all diseases. So really important part of managing them. And what's the difference between physical activity and exercise? I get asked that all the time. So physical activity is anything you're doing, any movement from when you wake up. And exercise is a planned and structured approach to, to physical activity. So obviously park run would be an exercise. You plan to do it every Saturday. Cardiovascular exercise, mistakenly, it's just considered as fitness, but it is a specific thing. It's any exercise that challenges the heart and vessels. So when I design an exercise program, I have to include all the components of fitness. And this is where often people can go wrong when they're managing something like arthritis. They, they address one component and not all of them. So the components are, are aerobic. So that's things like running and walking, muscle strength and endurance. So that came out quite strongly, particularly in, in Laura's um, talk, that, that muscular fitness is really important. Flexibility, so keeping the joints um, moving properly, moving fully, that's to use it or lose it. And particularly as we get older, it can get very easy, particularly with modern, the modern way we live, that you don't push your joints through range. Balance and coordination, and that can really reduce as we get older. If you think about it, little kids would climb trees, balance on things, and we tend to avoid that as we get older. And body composition. So have, having a healthy body composition is an important part of being a fit person. And so how much should you be doing? So WHO, World Health Organization, review this regularly. And the, the general um, rule of thumb is 150 minutes of moderate per week, moderate activity per week, or you can actually be doing more vigorously and it's 75 minutes. That you should do muscle strengthening work on two or more days per week. And this is a, a one that's coming more recently that even if you're doing all that, don't spend as much time sitting. That was very hard in lockdown. So a lot of us spent a lot of time looking at a computer screen during that time. So that's an important thing as well. Like you, you keep moving during the day. However, I don't think in 150 minutes, I never, I never think like that. We tend to talk in half hours or in hours when we're thinking about doing something across a week. So we, a couple of years ago, we asked patients coming into our rheumatology clinics, are they meeting those physical activity guidelines? They found it confusing. I would, I would certainly rather say five half hour sessions a week than 150 minutes. So that, that 150 minutes, that 75 minutes just didn't clock with people. So about 75% just didn't get that. And there were barriers to, to exercise, a lot of which we can overcome with education. And most people weren't meeting the guidelines. They weren't fit enough or they weren't active enough. And so that kind of underpinned a lot of research that we were doing after that. So with someone with arthritis, what does that mean? It means you need to do some aerobic exercise nearly every day for about half an hour, most days of the week. So walking, swimming, cycling, park run, obviously. Try and do some weight training exercises twice a week. And that doesn't mean you have to go to a gym and lift big weights. I'll, I'll show you a little bit later in the talk. And that you have a regular stretching routine. So it's particularly your major joints. So you move them through a full range of motion as, as, as often as possible. And that can be every day. 
and that you pick an exercise routine that you can like and so you, that you like so you'll stick with it then so the, the the biggest mistake people make is trying something new and saying this is the thing that i'm going to do i'm going to invest in it but really we know that where longevity comes is something people like there's a community they meet other people to do it or if they like exercising on their own it's convenient for them they can fit it in with their lifestyle you're more likely to stick to it Lots of evidence for prescribing exercise and management of, of rheumatoid arthritis. Um, Ursula came up with that. She reviewed that. Really good evidence that it helps improve fitness, muscle strength, and people's ability to live every day and do well. We have no studies that have shown people get worse with exercise um, in rheumatoid arthritis, which is really important because that's one of the biggest worries people come up with. And then in op um, uh, osteoarthritis, we have this big uh, body called the Cochrane Collaboration. So their role is to pull all research together and, and synthesize it, come up with the, what it's all saying in, in easily digestible messages. So again, strong evidence that people benefit from it. It helps relieve pain and, and it helps them live a better life. They can move better, they're more active. Particularly a, an exercise approach which works in improving strength, that range of motion, the movement of the joints and aerobic exercise. So all of those components of fitness that I said. It doesn't cause OA, and I'll come back to that because, again, myth busting this morning, that is one of them. Um, and then we've done lots of research as a group. Laura and I have done a couple of studies together. One of the things we've done is pull papers together and given recommendations from it. And they all show that it's a really good thing. Exercise is a really good thing for helping you live a better life if you have arthritis, feeling better, your pain is better managed, you're more active. And it also will help those other diseases that sometimes go with arthritis that, that we call comorbidities, things like heart disease, it'll help you avoid getting those or help you manage those if you have them. So how does it work? Um, Ursula talked a lot about that, but generally exercise reduces inflammation in, our, in rheumatoid arthritis. The big one is muscle mass. If you can keep your muscle up and your fat mass down, it re helps reduce inflammation. It's something I see all the time, particularly if people are quite slim, they're quite light on the scales, they're weighing what they did 20 years ago, but what we, they don't know is that the muscle has gone down. The higher your muscle mass, the higher your metabolism, so it'll help you burn fat as well. We also know that exercise helps suppress those um, inflammatory, what we call inflammatory cytokines, so it reduces your inflammation if you exercise. Um, in, in OA, it helps reduce inflammation in the synovial fluid in that, that joint layer. And cartilage really likes loading. We see, we see studies in astronauts, who look at astronauts who go up to space, we do MRIs on them before they go to space and after. We see they've got all kinds of joint changes because they've not been loading, particularly in things like the discs of their back. And we know, again, same as RA, it reduces inflammation and it has a positive effect on impairments associated with disease. So why doesn't everyone get stuck in? People are afraid of making their joints worse and worsening their symptoms. So they're fearful and, and they've maybe tried exercise regimes, they've gone into it and, and it just hasn't worked for them. Pain, people are anxious about exercising with pain. And actually what we do know that at, it, it may not happen straight away, but exercise will generally help reduce pain. People are fatigued, that can be associated with their disease and they lack energy, maybe fatigue because of lack of fitness. They can't do certain things, their feet hurt, maybe their hips don't move fully. So there's limitations which for them become barriers to try all kinds of different exercises. Time, they, maybe they're very busy, they have minding kids or um, care for an older relative, or access to facilities, that's where Park Run is amazing. Um, and that's why I refer patients to Park Run because it's public parks. So that's where we're waving the flag there. Motivation and sometimes motivation can come from really not understanding how much it can help you. And maybe that it won't take place straight away. We know that any of our exercise studies, we need to be looking at this intervention for 12 weeks before we really see the changes start to take place. And then mixed messages from healthcare providers. So it's very easy as a healthcare provider to say to your patients, if I tell you to do nothing, I know you won't get worse. 
in the short term anyway. So sometimes we overprotect ourselves as a healthcare provider and are very conservative on what we tell patients to do. So people get mixed messages. And I, I see that even with people that friends of mine who, who I exercise with that they will be told by somebody, oh, don't, don't train for six weeks and it'll go away. Well, maybe, but they'll also get deconditioned. So getting started, how do you get started even? Tailor the exercise for you. So get someone to help you um, or think about what will work for you, what you like, maybe what you can do with family members. You should try and include some moderate to high intensity aerobic exercise. So something where you get your heart rate a lot higher and you're breathing quite hard because we know that, that that's good and some flexibility exercises. Um, in arthritis, we know that you have flare ups. You can have bad weeks and you can have good weeks and you can have a bad week that comes out of the blue for no reason. And what we what is really important is that we guide you through it, that you keep going even through that. You moderate what you're doing during that time. And then as soon as you can, you get back to it. And that's where we see a lot of drop off when we prescribe exercise in arthritis. That people have a bad week and then they stop doing what they got into a habit of doing. So physios, this is obviously I'm a physio and, and how we work with people that we don't fix people, we coach people. So we help people to self-manage and that's what's really important that what we're looking for you doing here is, is helping to manage your own condition. Goal setting is important. So graduated start. So I think if, you, if you're looking to do park run and you nowhere near getting 5K done, a, a couch to 5K is really good. There's lots of online programs for that. There's, there's groups around the place are doing that. And um, certainly in my community, there is. Choose activities that you would like. Um, don't be a hero. Balance aspiration against reality. Don't um, set yourself goals that are too high. So keep, you know, if you're gonna eat an elephant, um, don't eat it all at once. So little bits at a time, it's really important. And measure your progress. So that's why part run works, you get your time. But fitness wearables are everywhere now. And we've all got ones on our phone that you can measure what you're doing, how quickly you do it or how far you go. And, and write that down, that can be helpful. And make sure your program progresses, that you're actually doing a little bit more as you go along have a contingency plan in place for when life gets in the way when it, for when you have a bad week or Christmas happens or somebody gets sick or you're too busy at work and, and what you're going to do through that plan, through that uh, period. So aerobic exercise, so you want to do moderate to high intensity, 30 minutes, three times a week, about five times a week is great. You can mix it up You can do part run on Saturday. What we do know about Park run is when people get into a habit of doing once a week, they're more likely to do it again, maybe on their own during the week. So it has this, this um, crossover effect. So aerobic activity most days. So weight bearing is really important. So running and walking to preserve bone health. So you might want to do on the other days, you might want to do cycling or swimming. A, a note about exercise in nature, we've got some great research that shows that it has a particular effect, particularly on mental health. So in, in recent years, a, a few publications have shown that. Again, that's where part run can work really well. You're out and about and you're in the fresh air and there's the plants and trees and animals around, which can be really beneficial. And then let's come to this one. Is running bad for your knees? The answer is no. We've got more and re more research that's come back um, in recent years. There's, there's groups around the world doing that. And they've shown that even in marathon runners, that um, running does not cause um, arthritis in your knees. And in fact, we've shown in some studies of marathon runners that they have a reduced risk of getting hip and knee replacement due to OA. Um, in, in later life. So no, running does not, is not bad for your knees. Some nice bits of information around the place for monitoring your exercise intensity. If you don't know how to take your heart rate, there's a nice little infographic here on the American College of Sports Medicine website. That's open access. You can have a look at that. Um, get used to feeling when you're at the right level, because we know that sometimes in arthritis, people underdose, they don't exercise hard enough. It's a balance, it's finding that point, but you do need to make sure that your heart rate comes off a little bit. In aerobic exercise to get benefits, you want your heart rate at about 65% of your heart rate max. So heart rate max is about 220 minus your age, and you want 65% of that. Strength training, super important. If you're doing part run, you need to add this on. 
Um, we, we know that it helps improve inflammation, um, pain, disease activity, and morning stiffness. So there's all different ways you can do this. You don't actually need weights to do it. You can do it with body weights. Um, and, and there's all different things you can do at home if you don't have access to a, a gym. About eight to 12 reps per exercise, three sets are really important. That's what we call RM, but generally as a rule of thumb, something you can lift are about 12 reps. Just get into the, to the edge of it not being doable after 12, that will be a, a good um, point to go in at. And you want about three sets of those about three times, two to three days a week. And gradually increase as you go along and manage during flares, just be careful during flares. And lots of benefits for resistance training, not just for people who have arthritis, but in general, and it often can get missed off. It's particularly as you get older, you get to midlife and older, people can be doing lots of running and walking, but you do need to throw some resistance exercise in there. Key exercises I give to my patients, the lunge on the left, that's a great one because it challenges your balance. It challenges your range of motion. It makes you move right through the range of motion in your hip and your knee and your ankle. Um, and it's very good for strength, get people to hold onto a chair beside them. I do my part run on a Saturday and I go back to the house and I do a load of lunges. The one in the middle for upper body, chest press. You can just use two water bottles filled there or two cans of beans. And on the right, the one I really love is a squat. We're so bad in Western society at doing that one. So people can often move from a very small range and I try and get them to do a little bit of a deeper squat and they struggle to get out of it. So that's a great exercise to stick with and it targets a lot of muscle groups. Great for back pain. Flexibility exercise, really important. Large joints should move through the full range every day. Have a stretching routine and perform a couple of times a week and work with a physio to a program for specific joints you might be having problems with. I like programs like yoga and Pilates because they, they're very systematic at taking you through all your joints. And then balance and coordination, we get really poor at this as we get older. So try and incorporate that into other exercise routines. So that's why things like yoga is really good or that lunge exercise I was showing you. And as directly as possible, standing on one foot while you're waiting for a kettle to boil is a starting point. So increasingly important. Some practical considerations, footwear that's comfy, warm up before you start. The best running shoes are not the most expensive running shoes. Decades of research has shown there isn't a running shoe that prevents injury. So something that's comfortable and you don't need to spend a lot of money. I like these, these are hokas because they're big and squishy and um, they're a little bit cheaper because the wrappers aren't wearing them yet. So I get my patients to buy these, but you don't need to spend a lot of money. You can get them from Primark if you want to. And if you have a lot of foot pain, um, think about visiting um, a podiatrist or somebody specializing in, in feet because they might be able to prescribe you some custom made inserts that can really help you get going and be sensible about your exercise environment. Note about fatigue, it may be part of your inflammatory arthritis. Um, so you may have disrupted sleep due to pain. So maybe talk to your um, doctor about managing your pain at night. That should get better as you get fitter. Medication, mood, but often fatigue can be associated with decondition. So as you get more fit, that, that should help. A nice study that Laura did a couple of years ago that showed that exercise improved fatigue, um, both physical and mental. And that pacing was really important for, for managing this and, and having your exercise as a fatigue managing program. So in summary, really strong evidence that increasing physical activity and exercise can improve your symptoms and overall health in arthritis. Exercise does not make arthritis worse. In fact, it should be an important part of your managing. It helps fatigue. Maybe that can take a little while to get through, but generally in the long run, it will help you manage your fatigue. And it's a crucial part of managing your condition. So thank you very much. I'll hand you back. Um, Thanks so much, Fiona. Um, yeah, that is, that's great. And I have just noticed the time. So we're gonna have a bit of a, a quick fire round of questions, if that's okay. I have been taking a note. Thanks to everyone that's, that's asked questions. We've had some really interesting ones. Um, so just to kick off, um, Jeff's been asking about post-operative exercise. I'm presuming Jeff has had a, a knee replacement, perhaps. So keen to hear different, um, a different view to his knee surgeon uh, re-post-op exercise. 
have you got any advice there or you know he then goes on to say will his uh, replacement knees wear out any quicker if he does more running yeah and no, i can i i can uh, for me the patients that i see post knee the biggest challenge for them in the first instance is their range of motion so i i, I feel that before they start to you know, the, the classic knees, the post-op that come to me have a 20 to 30% fixed flexion deformity. So they're stuck a little bit like this and getting straight tends to be the first challenge post-knee, Fiona, I'm sure you, and, and after you manage to get a good hinge back, it's then that you really start to work on building the muscles above and below. Fiona, I'm sure you have more specific advice. Yeah, no, I totally agree with that. So that's about good rehab. So I, you've had your knee replaced so you can actually get active again. That's that you just remember why. I mean, it obviously it reduces your pain. That's that's important. That's a massive motivation for most people. And what becomes a big limiting thing. But the whole idea is think about why you had it replaced. It's so you can get up and active and moving again. Mm -hmm. And there's people who are out there running part run with hip and knee replacements and living their best life for their for their condition. So there's no reason why not. But it, it often it's about. Um, linking in with a good rehab specialist, whether that's a physio or strength conditioning person who understands this and getting the right rehab program. Great stuff. I think Jeff's commented to say that he's had back, both knees and both hips. So, yeah. There's, so now, there's... now it's get out and use those great new hips and knees. Yeah, functionally and, and get your life back. Great. So um, a quick question. Um, who? Sorry to ask a stupid question, but no question is stupid. Is a toe bunion related to arthritis? Yes. Quick, quick, quick answer. Ask oh, a quick yeah. question, get That's a quick answer. The, uh, the loading in your body tends to go through your first and second toes. And so uh, the first toe is a real key point for osteoarthritis in the feet. And uh, bunions generally relate to osteoarthritis in the feet. And um, you can get them a lot earlier than you would get arthritis in other spots. But that just relates to the fact that we've been standing on those toes our whole lives. Lovely. I hope that answers your, your question. There's a couple of questions around medications and supplements. So Jeff asks, should we proactively take anti-inflammatories like ibuprofen before exercise? Are there any supplements that can help? Um, and then just as a follow on, Josh asked, what's the biggest focus for diet and supplements in preventing or helping um, osteoarthritis? Lots of things available. Is there any evidence? Do you want me to take that, Fiona? Yeah, yeah. So the, the brufen, so taking a, so I suppose ibuprofen or, or which is a kind of a low potency and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory. If you, I have lots of patients who have 200 milligrams of ibuprofen, say before they go for a run or before they, go, they golf or before they do something specific. And they tend to have evolved that as part of their own management strategies. Now, ibuprofen and non-steroidals like diphene and their cousins, they're not for everybody. But if you have no reason not to take them and you're otherwise healthy and you're taking them as needed to facilitate an exercise process, then I, I'm completely fine with that. And I think it's a good strategy. When non most become most problematic is in people who shouldn't take them. So that's people who have kidney disease, people who have some gastric issues um, and people who are intolerant of them. So lots of people find that they get a little bit kind of sick with it non -steroidals. but if you tolerate them and there's no reason not to take them then I think that's a good management strategy lovely thank you oh, um, supplements I'm sorry oh supplements um, so, yeah so, so the, the data is so if you so turmeric uh, vitamin d um, there's a few other kind of cod liver oil, those kind of things. So there's very little data that they are of significant benefit on a larger scale. On an individual scale, some people find them helpful. Certainly vitamin D, keeping your vitamin D to within a healthy range is, it seems to be good for your bone health. And um, the only problem is, is if you take excessive amounts of vitamin D, it can lead to things like kidney stones and nobody wants those. They're terrible. Um, the cod liver oil, turmeric, there are some animal data for turmeric as an anti-inflammatory and certainly there's no harm in turmeric. So I don't mind people taking it, but I, it's not backed up by a huge amount of human literature. Um, and a cod liver oil, I'm not aware of massive clinical trials or anything on it, but there's no harm in it. Lovely, thank you. When I had um, a hip injury, I had so many turmeric lattes just because I thought it was going to help. It helped psychologically anyway. So, um, uh, so Steve's asked a couple of questions. I hope your first question, Steve's probably been answered with all those suggestions that Fiona gave around different exercises, strength work, yoga. So it might be that you need to hit your um, yoga mat. 
Steve, to, to tackle some of those. And then your second question is, is it possible that unexplained fatigue in a fit person with RA might be the body fighting against inflammation? So, so fatigue in rheumatoid arthritis and fatigue in autoimmune disease is completely different to fatigue that the rest of us have, feel all the time. So the I'm a little bit tired is completely different to the I have inflammatory disease and my body is completely flat. So I just want to acknowledge that, that that is more common and it is a different entity to what the rest of us are complaining about on a constant basis. So I just I think it's helpful to, for doctors to acknowledge that fatigue with autoimmune disease is different. Um, it does get better with exercise. And certainly exercise improves the quality of your sleep, which then does improve the fatigue. Um, and there is a little bit of data that tight control of your rheumatoid arthritis also in turn has an impact on um, fatigue levels. So it is worth looking at what medication you're taking, making sure that you have as tight a control as possible on your fatigue levels. And sometimes, and I'm not, I'm very pro methotrexate, but sometimes methotrexate can make people a little bit tired. Um, and can contribute to that but most of it I think is disease activity plus activity levels. I think the fatigue is a hard one because people beat themselves up about it because they go is this psychological so I think it's useful to measure your physiological parameters and by that I mean have something that measures your heart rate when you're running or you're walking and is it coming up a little bit too quickly or is it not moving at all so I mean that's what we do in elite athletes so so kind of get used to what's normal for you resting heart rate so just get you one yourself one of those watches from Argos what is your resting heart rate in the morning mm -hmm. and then if if that's not the case then make sure you don't don't ignore fatigue I mean we don't it's really important talk to somebody about fatigue that's why it's useful if you can link in with someone particularly if you have inflammatory arthritis who's going to guide you a little bit through the exercise program who you can actually discuss those issues with if you're feeling more fatigued than, than normal or struggling a little bit and, and that's where the individual tailoring comes in that you can change things you can pair it back you can take components out so all the principles we use in elite athletes can be, we, we actually use exactly the same in our normal patients. Good stuff. So just one final comment then from the chat is just to thank Sarah um, Goodgen who shared some chair-based exercises for anybody wanting um, a gradual start to exercise and also some self-management resources. So if you click through, you can, um, you can see them. So thanks a lot, Sarah. Um, so I'm just going to start to wrap this up. Thank you so much to our speakers, to Fiona, Laura and Ursula um, for, for taking the time to, to share their knowledge and insights today. Um, it's been really, really interesting and, and insightful session. The recording of this seminar will be available on the, um, the YouTube channel for the AWRC, which we will um, put a link to in, in the chat. Um, We've just got a, a flyer there for the for the next seminar. So keep your eyes peeled for the registration details for that in early next um, year. And that's that's it for now. Thank you so much for joining us. Take care, everyone, and um, happy park running. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Happy World Arthritis Day. <laughs> Thank you. Bye.